respectful of my skin to come to you. Do that, 
First, let's come to the most important point. Again, you know, uh, we have come, we're coming from very different backgrounds, but we have experienced all this in, in a lot of different cases where we might have seen all of these different people who start claiming themselves as being hard. Or, you know, certain other attributes that they might just identify as symbol, symbols that they might see or some other attributes <coughs> they might see and just start declaring anybody as being hard. Right? So how do we know exactly that what is being said is correct or not? If, if we go by the simple statement that when God comes in and appears, he declares himself as God. Krishna also in different places has declared himself as being the Supreme Personality of God. But if we go by that, then anybody and everybody can stand up and start calling themselves as the Supreme Personality of God. So does that help in actually identifying? Because the imposters are kind of doing things in a similar way as Krishna himself, even then claiming themselves to be God. Or similarly, otherwise, you know, if we are not having the full level of intelligence, and this is a common occurrence that I've been born and brought up in India, I've seen that happening a lot over there, is you see some physical deformities in somebody. You know, a child is born with extra limbs or something. Oh, that's God, that's God. They come to the conclusion, oh, four arms, Vishnu. Because he's a boy, and if it's a girl, okay, look up. Right? So we just kind of jump to these things just because of the limited uh, knowledge on the topic of who God is actually. Right? It is important from, for us to take away from this very chapter to actually understand and identify who God is so that we put our devotion and all our activities in the right direction. Right? So, um, First, let's just define who God actually is by the scriptural definition. Yes, sir. Oh, that one, you're not using the key gate sound. That's fine. But the mic, I think, is on. Don't you want to. Is this off? Oh, no, no, no. There's a problem with. Oh, that's a problem. That's fine. I'll just remove it in front. No, no, no. No, that is kind of obstructing me. No, why is it not working? You want to keep. <laughs> okay, so first, let's just define who God is, right? Because again, we talk of God in very different loose terms. We talk about demigods, we talk about all the other things. But what is the definition of God in, per se? Right? Uh, in Sanskrit, or in, uh, we would say Bhagavan. The word Bhagavan, uh, what it means is one who has the, the six bhagas, six opulences, in the highest quantity possible, in 100%. So what are those six bhagas? It's knowledge, wealth, fame, strength, beauty, and renunciation. And when we say that somebody need for somebody to be a, to be Bhagwan, to be God, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, these six needs to be hundred percent. How do we define hundred percent? A simple way to understand that is hundred um, percent is like full. There can be nothing more than that, right? So somebody who's having these qualities in full. How do we define that? It's not a quantitative way of doing it. Simplest way to understand that is the quantity which there is no equal or greater than. That's full, that's 100%, that's the maximum. Right? So anybody having the full all wealth, for example, let's take that as an example, right? Is one who's going to be God. Now, I have certain amount of dollars in my bank balance, somebody might have greater, somebody else might have greater, and so on and so forth. Even the richest person, as they claim it in terms of the dollar values, uh, does not claim everything. But Krishna does claim everything. Right? He is the proprietor of everything. He owns everything. Right? So they can, when he owns everything, so there cannot be anybody who is more rich than him because when everything is owned, there is nothing left for anybody else to own. Right? So the, in such ways, we can we can very clearly understand who God is. But let's come to the point of you know um, understanding and validating when somebody starts claiming themselves as being God, somebody put some the supreme personality of Godhead or Bhagavan. How do we understand that? Let's take a parallel in what we do in the today's world. Do we understand the term authentication? Like authenticate somebody. Right? Somebody who's from an IT background probably would better relate to that one. But in any, any sense, whenever you're going somewhere, say for example, you go to the bank branch, 
and you're trying to withdraw money. Uh, and you say, you know, I have a bank account here and I want to take out money from them. The person must authenticate that you are who you claim to be. Right? That is authentication. In a simple definition terms, if you are claiming to be the uh, owner of this bank account, then basically you should be able to prove that and should be able to ascertain that as a, as a thing. So you are who you claim to be is authentication. Right? So how do we do that in authentication in the materialistic terms? You know, if you want to go and check your uh, emails, what do you give it? Your username and password. The password is your unique characteristic that nobody else is supposed to be having. Right? It is by that unique characteristic of yours are you identifying yourself. <coughs> or in the similar ways, I say this phone is mine, but how do, how do I authenticate myself with this phone? Ask. We use the face ID or any other similar thing, right? So, uh, just to be 100% sure uh, that you are who you claim to be, there are certain characters, there are certain processes that is following. And what is that process in terms of uh, understanding who God is? Or what is that authentication process? There is a term that you know you might have probably heard, is, it's called having a telltale sign of certain thing. Let me take another material example to exactly explain what does telltale signs of a certain thing mean, right? When you take a piece of metal, right, a metal can break sometimes. So there is something called a fatigue crack. So what happens is when you're continuously using a piece of metal for, let's say, for example, a, a, the body of a car or an aircraft or anything else, it keeps going through different motions. Slowly, 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 that motion makes the metal weak and it breaks. That's a fatigue crack. Versus, you know, something happens, you, you have this piece of aluminium box or something, you throw it down and it smashes off, that's a very different type of thing. So, how do these investigators and everybody understand that a particular crack is a fatigue crack? Because it has a very characteristic telltale sign, which identifies it to be, like, you know, the cut is absolutely clean, straight. On one side, you're going to see certain rust elements coming in, and on the other side, it's a fresh crack. You know, there are certain characters like things like this which clearly say that the crack has developed over the period of time and hence it's a fatigue crack, right? So similarly, now, uh, similarly there are characteristics that we can identify with respect to Supreme Personality of Godhead also and that is what helps us understand that yes, the characteristics match and when we are saying face ID on a phone, okay, the, you know, the face structure, everything matches to what the profile is. So yes, this is the person. Similarly, we also have the scripture very nicely gave us these characteristics which clearly define what the Supreme Personality of God has as characteristics. <coughs> Let's look at this chapter first. Okay, um, I'll look at verse 9 and 10 real quick at the start. Okay, and while, while you come to that verse 2, if you, if you can open that 9 and 10, you can go to the index of the chapter. Why are we continuously comparing to the parallels of the science and everything for everything that we are talking about God and Krishna consciousness also? Just to make sure that we understand the fact that Krishna consciousness is a science. Worshipping Krishna, understanding who Krishna is, is a science. It's not fanatic. There is a very solid, strong basis because of which we do things and we don't do things. Right? So the ninth and verse um, is clearly saying it's not Brahma. The master of the entire universe arrived there, accompanied by all demigods and their chiefs, seeing the lines of Lord Vishnu's palm on King Prithu's right hand, and impression of a lotus flower on the sole of his feet, Lord Brahma could understand that King Prithu was a partial expansion of Supreme Personality of God. There are just a few characteristics given over here. They're saying, okay, because the lines are clearly in the hands are showing, there being uh, the lotus flower on the sole of the feet that clearly shows that this is the Supreme Personality of God or their expansion. Does any one of us have that characteristic? No, right? And we can try and fake it, but that's not going to be real. I'm just going to also quickly refer to another interesting part. And again, just, I'm just reading out to just explain the fact that the process of saying somebody is an incarnation or not is a very scientific process. I'm going to the letter of devotion. This is chapter 21. 
uh, and there's a section which, call, uh, which is called auspicious characteristics. I'm just giving a couple of lines out from there. Um, this is, if you're opening it over, it's 21 electron devotion. There are certain characteristics of different limbs that are considered to be very auspicious and are fully present in the body of the Lord. In this connection, one friend of Narada, uh, uh, sorry, one friend of Narada Maharaj, speaking about Lord Krishna's auspicious bodily symptoms, said, "My dear king of the cowherd, I can find. My dear king of the cowherd, I can find 32 auspicious symbols." On the body of your son. I, am, I wonder, and I'm just going to speak that part and go to the next one, and he's explaining what, what he's seen. He continued This boy has reddish lustre in seven places his eye, the end of his hands, the end of his legs, his palate, his lips, his tongue, and his nails. A reddish lustre in these seven places <coughs> is considered to be auspicious. Three parts of his body are very broad. His waist, forehead, and chest. Three parts of his body are short. His neck, thighs, and genitals. Three parts of his body are very deep. His voice, intelligence, and name. There is the highness in five parts of his body. His nose, arms, ears, forehead, and thighs. In five parts of his body, there is fineness. His skin, the hair on his forehead. And on the outer part of his body, his teeth and his fingertips. The aggregate of all these bodily features is manifest only in the body of great personalities. And towards the end, you can also see, you know, the more description. Your son possesses various wonderful uh, fate lines on his palm. There are signs of lotus flower and wheel on his palm. On his soul are the signs of a flag, a thunderbolt, a fish, a rod for controlling elephant, and a lotus flower. Please observe how auspicious these signs are. These are just how multiple, and again, these descriptions you're going to find multiple verses, many, many, many different places of how, you know, there are certain very characteristic signs, as we were saying, the telltale signs, by which you can say, Supreme Personality of God or not. Right? So one who is intelligent, intelligent and is reading the scriptures can clearly segregate somebody who is an imposter versus Supreme Personality of God itself. Now you always, for any um, any understanding or validation, we always <coughs> use the principle of three pillars, right? Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru, right? So. There are certain symbols, and that's why I kind of mentioned this concept of, you know, looking at certain deformities of the body and starting to identify them as the, the you know, there are all these cases where uh, kids are born with deformities. I took that example of extra limbs, for example, and then people say, oh, these are the characteristics of the God, so this, this is God. But the supreme personality of God is going to have all of these characteristics, right? It's not just one here and there. Right? And of course, the difference is a child born with an extra limb and Lord Vishnu himself is a difference. Like, Lord Vishnu does not need that additional medical attention and surgeries because of that extra limb, right? Uh, if we have to call it extra. So, basically, what, what we're trying to establish over here is the fact that there's a very clear cut definition of Supreme Personality of Godhead. There are very clear cut telltale signs that will help us identify which cannot be replicated as a complete whole. There might be certain characters here and there that people might fake or might just be like, you know, something like that, but uh, not all characteristics, like the six bhagas along with all of these characteristics uh, on the bodies that can make, they have very unique characteristics of what people are about. So if somebody is out there, uh, these terminologies are very um, commonly used, at least, you know, in the, by the Indian news channels and everything, they call them the God Man. People who start claiming themselves as God, like Ashila Prabhupada is mentioning uh, in the in the purport also. So these people they claim themselves to be God and they say, start worshipping me, start worshipping me, start worshipping me, right? And then they will say, like, okay, uh, like you worship God, you're supposed to be worshipping me, and all of those different aspects. Now, but one interesting thing is because you don't fully have the six mothers as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they can kind of 
it imitated and things like, you know, for Krishna did not say, I can do it. Right? But Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill, can you? That is where they will come, no. And then they come up with all of these concepts. So somebody has heard of those, right? They will come up with these concepts because Daridra Narayan. Right? Daridra means the poor. You are a poor Narayan. You are not the full thing right now because you are in the material world and you are you are covered by the modes of material nature and Maya and all of those things. So you are the poor Narayan, you are the Daridra Narayan. Then the, that is the kind of arguments that start coming in to try and justify why they are not able to live to go on. This is all bogus philosophy. Right? When we try and understand from an authoritative source, from a proper parampara system, we can properly understand these characteristics scientifically. By science, I mean having a very objective things which is not driven by emotions. We are not fanatics. Right? So now let's look into this chapter again, coming back to our chapter 15. Uh, let's see how this is happening, right? So let's look at verse 2 for a second. The great sages were highly learned in Vedic knowledge. When they saw the male and female born of the arms of Venu's body, they were very pleased. For they could understand that the couple was an, was an expansion of the plenary portion of Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of God. So that's where first the sadhus are identifying certain symbols. But they don't at that very moment declare it. Because they need an authority also. He said, Sadhu, Shastra, Guru. Right? So, when we, the verse that we looked at before, the 9th and 10th verse, that is where Lord Brahma, he comes in and he identifies and makes sure he does that proper authentication process, all characteristics matching, yes, Supreme Personality of God. That is how we understand things. That is how we accept things. We just don't go by anybody whimsically claiming themselves or anybody who's flattering them whimsically saying they are God. Now I will ask a very interesting question before we go to the next part. Lord Chaitanya, is he the Supreme Personality of God? Yes. yes. How do we know? So what proof is there? Um, yeah. Lord Chaitanya footprints, we have... Yes. Uh, All those very telltale signs is there. <coughs> so I'm just going to read, this is a uh, one thought of the day that my Guru Maharaj is like the sense every day in which is very clearly articulated Shastric evidence of that fact and it is only by that Shastric evidence that we take certain things as, as being true, right? So like for example, I'm just reading a couple of them is given multiple quotes from different scriptures So for example, uh, it's giving quotation from Srimad Bhagavatam 11th chapter 5th canto 32nd verse which is saying, in the age of Kali Intelligent person perform congregational chanting to worship the incarnation of Godhead who constantly sings the holy name of Krishna. Although his complexion is not blackish, he is Krishna himself. He is accompanied by his associates, servants, weapons, and confidential companions. This is an indirect reference. Let's go to something which is very direct. This is this is 11.5.32. Okay. So similarly, there is verse from Garud Purana, which is very clearly saying, in the first part of Kali Yuga, I will appear in my complete spiritual form in Mayapur, Navadi, and become the son of Sachi. Right? There's so many such, again, this entire email is full of these things. Again, this is one from Narada Purana. Okay, says, so, O Brahmana, I will deliver all the worlds, uh, concealing myself in the form of a devotee of the Lord in Kali Yuga. All of these things are very characteristic tell -tell signs about that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would appear and, you know, given the name of the mother, etc. In the same way, there are characteristics of uh, uh, Kal Kalki Avatar, which is come at the end of Kal Kali Yuga, is also given, like time, place. <coughs> All of this information the scriptures gives us. So Tilman is not matched with that completely and authorized by an authoritative uh, person as being saying, yes, scriptures, the scripture matches. You know how in our offices we have a maker and a checker process? Right? The maker and checker process is if somebody is making an entry, there's one who made that entry and then somebody else makes a check of that entry to make sure it is correct. So the scriptures have given the fact that there is a checker process also 
where the acharyas would validate saying yes, matching, correct. Right? So that is how we accept. We just don't accept any any the Supreme Personality of God. That brings me to the second part of what we were talking about. So who is actually a guru? Is guru God? They're not. And one who claims to be a god is not actually an authorized guru. As you have to very clearly with me before. So a guru is one who is very who is a very transparent, clear, wire medium for us to approach God, the Supreme Personality of God. And how are they very transparent wire mediums? Because through the Parampara system, they have passed on knowledge from Krishna himself, one by one, one by one, one by one, down without any additions to subtraction. That is what makes them transparent. Transparent is like what you are able to see through completely. There is no <coughs> opaqueness in between. It's not translucent, they're not they're not tinted in terms of making the color look black or anything. There's no change. Transparent means you see as things as it is. So when the knowledge has been given by Krishna about himself and all of this information about the Supreme Personality of God is being given, it's transparently as is without adulterations being given down. And what is giving you that and is being able to convince you about that conclusion itself is a bona fide guru. Not one who would claim himself as being God or claim something else as a process such as you are God, I am God, everything else. That cannot be a bona fide guru. Right? Good. Yes. So, uh, but uh, it might be uh, contradictory, but in Srimad Bhagavatam only, I think 11.17.27. That's written like Acharya Mangrichin. Krishna says we uh, like we have to look Acharya as Krishna only. Fantastic. Thank you for bringing that up. I was coming to that point next. So how do how are we supposed to be looking at gurus? Like the entire Shri Prabhupada, our guru, Shri Prabhupada's disciple and everybody. We're supposed to be, we know they are not God. But they are because they are transparent via medium for us to reach the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is how we respect them. Let's take an analogy that Srila Prabhupada himself has given very nicely. There is a president of a country. Canada does not have it, but let's say for example India is a country. Right? So there is a president of, of a country and then there are ambassadors in different countries who represent the president. Is the ambassador the president? No. no. But if an ambassador goes into a meeting and says something, he is equally authorized to represent the president. They are given the same immunity, they say given the same welcome, same respects, and their whatever he says is considered as the word of the president himself. So even though we understand the difference between Guru and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we still understand the fact that they are transparent by our mediums and so we respect them in that same way. But we understand the difference. Is, does that answer the question? <laughs> So, one quick question again I am going to ask before I come to the final part. Why do these bogus gurus and all of these godmens or whatever you want to call them, why do they exist? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge, but then, you know, Krishna can just kill them. You know, finish them. Clarity of speech. Clarity of speech. Unclarity. Unclarity. Okay. False, so, false ego. They have false ego to take fame like this. Yes, but that is only part of, okay, so let me explain what Shri Lopupada is saying in, in, in a couple of places. These bogus gurus are existing and they are able to cheat because people want to be cheated. Krishna is so merciful that he gives what we want. You want to be cheated? Sure. I'm going to give you bogus gurus whom you're going to follow and cheat yourself. And what is the kind of cheating we want to do with ourselves? We want to try and think of the spiritual process to be a cheap process. It is okay to do this. It is okay to do this. It is fine if I am not there. And so on and so forth. We want, when we approach a guru, when we say, um, in such and such circumstances, we don't say, uh, Gurudev, help me, with the, give me an instruction of what I am supposed to do. We don't go like that mostly. Like again, I know there are certain people who do that. But mostly we don't go like that. Mostly we go then, uh, can I do this? That's the kind of approach we usually have. And it's more of what we want to, what we want, we're just using the guru as a mechanism.
mechanism on this entire concept of spirituality is a mechanism to just validate that and just put in a word thing, yeah, he so he said so I'm doing. Like there's so many examples that can be given without, you know, I've not talked about individuals' names or stuff, but this very nice um, senior uh, Vaishnava uh, Acharya within his content. And uh, he told his disciple, like his actually his disciple came and asked the question saying, you're telling me to go to all of these different uh, government offices and everybody else so that you know temple arrangements can be done and you know uh, there's no bureaucratic trouble while doing things. This was in India, right? So he said, can I go to them without Bhoti Kurta and Tila? Because I feel that's kind of creating a uh, little barrier while for me to try and have a conversation with them and for me to engage. And then he thought for a second and said, okay, if you're feeling that as a barrier, sure, okay, go without that. But he extended that his, that that exemption to say, if my Guru Maharaj said it's okay for me to always be without Bhoti Kurta. <laughs> even if I'm coming to the temple, if, even if I'm etc. etc. Right? So that is our our uh, tendency to cheat. That is the four qualities that we get because of the body. We make mistakes, but we also cheat. So because we want to cheat, we want to create this easy process around us. That is why these bogus gurus exist. Because you know, we just want they will just say what we are, is we want to be pleasing so that we just go to them. Right? So what are we supposed to do in order to try and avoid ourselves to go be caught up with this bogusness around them? We have to ensure that the desires are true. Our desires needs to be to be pleasing Krishna and in our heart our desire should be to be getting authentic genuine knowledge and willing and wanting to follow all instructions to the highest of standards that is possible for us to do. What is possible for us to do is the instruction given to us. That's also given. When an instruction is given to us, we are able to follow that. That is why that instruction was given. So the following the instructions as it has been given, that is if our desire, then we will never be caught up in this concept of false bogus gurus or any other uh, you know, watered down philosophy or anything else. We will always end up finding guidance and instructions from a bona fide guru who will take us to the highest level of prema. So it's, that is what we are supposed to make sure. Right? Now, uh, coming to the final part of what I wanted to talk about is this. As, as Vaishnava, now we talked about the desire, but there are certain characteristics again in this verse that we are talking about over here. As a Vaishnava, uh, when, when we, we, we said your own uh, position, and we were reading this today morning also, you are supposed to be um, having a position, uh, like a very humble position, like the, you know, the, the grass on the floor. Like, what does it mean to be? Humble as a grass, but somebody comes and crushes you also, and you don't see anything. Right? So, that is what is the uh, instructions given. That, that is how humble we are supposed to be. So, if somebody is coming and glorifying, like uh, Prithu Maharaj over here comes saying, hey, I don't have this quality, true, glorifying them. When somebody is glorifying you, that's the position we take of humble, I don't have that quality. What are you talking about? And like Srila Prabhupada does, in so many different instances, and even all the all his disciples also, they will go to the person and say, why are you praising me? Whatever amazingness that you're seeing, amazing lecture, amazing whatever you're seeing, is nothing but what has been given to us by my previous gurus. I'm just passing it along. There's nothing that I'm doing. Right? So that is their attitude. So when somebody is glorifying you, that is the humble attitude that we are supposed to be taking. But there's an interesting aspect on the other side. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be glorifying the Vaishnavas. Right? And glorification of the Vaishnava means is looking at the good qualities and, and, and glorifying it. And saying, oh wow, what saying? Oh wow, what? We're supposed to be trying to find out any good quality out there and glorifying that very nicely. But this is the area I care about. You know what I'm saying? There is an important catch over here. There is a difference between flattering and glorifying. And each of us, how do we understand the line between glorifying and flattering? Think for yourself. How do we identify that is somebody, you know, genuinely uh, giving us encouragement 
through all the words or are they you know flattering us trying to get something out of us how we identify that and that is how we should take that as a factor while doing that interaction because as it was said at the end of the verse it's like when we are glorifying and we are glorifying in a way that you are saying oh what good qualities but the person knows that qualities don't exist that's like an insult so you see how that attribute of glorifying a Vaishnava, which is a very good quality to have, is tending towards a Vaishnava Aparadha. Right? Somebody comes to me and says, Oh, you are such an amazing singer. I know I am not. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, glorification, so why do we need to glorify? That will help us understand that why not flatter but glorify is because as a Vaishnava, when we look at somebody else, we are supposed to be looking at the good qualities. Two parts of it. We are supposed to be looking at the good qualities and say, Oh wow, amazing, amazing thing, amazing thing. I need to do something like that. So that's, you glorify them as amazing servants of the Lord and say, I want to try and imbibe that quality for myself. It's an uplifting thing for yourself. So that is why we need to glorify. Right? And uh, when we start trying to glorify with the intention to, you know, flatter because we want to try to get something out, that is where we've crossed the line and come to a point where it's now becoming dangerous. Right? So, the right attitude of glorification and, so when we look at uh, nectar of devotion, for example, there are all these loving exchanges that has been talked about and that interaction between Vaishnava is talked about very much in detail. We're also supposed to be, uh, you know, if you have not already done that, Look into this is the version of etiquette, and from there understand what is the right behavior, what is not, and all of those things. So all of this knowledge that Shiva Prabhupada has given us is for that reason, right? So we are supposed to be looking at the good qualities, appreciating the version of all, all the good qualities, and say, wow, I need to replicate that for myself, get inspiration of that, and you know, again, one more thing you have to understand is also you know. We have to understand our position. If this is a self introspection. We have to understand our position and we have to understand others' position. Not all devotees are the same level. That is the reason why the scriptures talk about Kanishta, Adhikari, Matyam, Adhikari, Uttama. Right? So, an Uttama Adhikari or Matyam Adhikari might be telling to a Kanishta, Adhikari, glorifying them as an encouragement. Right? Uh, Come on, you're doing good. You can do more. Amazing, very nice. Wow, you did one round of chanting? Fantastic. So that is, in a sense, you know, talks about that a little bit. Massage their ego a little bit. But with the right attitude. So if, if there is somebody who's a senior, can do that for a junior in order as a, as a matter of encouragement. <clears throat> when you're looking inside somebody senior and you're junior yourself, then the glorification is, wow, amazing. How amazing is he doing? I need to do the same. You cannot equate the same. You're chanting 16 and say, oh, wow, you're chanting one hour, and I should also do the same. <laughs> if you start doing that, then you're falling down, right? So we need to understand these aspects. Where your glorification is good, but that nitty gritties of things is also important for us. So those are three uh, important uh, things that I felt was a takeaway from this overall chapter, this verse, and this program. So we have a couple of minutes to three minutes left. We can do some questions or discussions. Anybody having challenges, want to add their realizations, ask questions, feel free to use it. Yes, sir. Hi, Krishna Thank you for the nice discussion. Um, on the point of Lord Chaitanya, um, not declaring himself he was God, I've heard some devotees say that if he declared himself as God, then other people in Kali Yuga would do the same. Correct. So in order to avoid that, he didn't. Is that like, is there a Shastric basis for that? Or yes, so he, you would find the entire Chaitanya Chaitamrita can multiple times to define that. So uh, there are all these incidents where, you know, um, his associates and all were trying to glorify him as the Supreme Personality of God and trying to let people understand he's the Supreme Personality of God. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will close his ears, run away from there, stop them, do all of those things. For the exact same reason as you rightly pointed out is because if he came as a devotee. And if devotees start claiming themselves to be God, people who are, you know, with that wrong mindset, they start trying to imitate. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be nice I'm like him, I'm also God. That is what he did not want. And he's 
So that's one part. The other part is he is also showing to us, uh, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is showing to us that if somebody comes and starts talking to you about things like you are God or something like that, what are what is our attitude supposed to be? Close your ears, run away. Because that's bogus philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. So that is him showing as an example to us what we are supposed to do. So both both the things are present there. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Anybody yeah. else? It might be a little off topic, uh, but still, as you were mentioning about the three pillars like Shastra, Sadhu, and Guru, so sometimes, like, our Acharyas and then the scriptures might be a little bit, you know, uh, no, not on the same thing. No, like, for example, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Sure. Uh, uh, we should technically do not uh, pay obeisances uh, in front of the altar when the altars are open. But I was listening to this uh, really awesome lecture by uh, Amogila Prabhuji, glorifying Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, telling like Radhanath Swami Maharaj told him like he used to pay obeisances to Jayapatak Swami Maharaj mm -hmm. when the altar short was and he, he used to say like I have that much respect for Maharaj that I cannot resist myself like yeah. pay obeisances to him. Right. So two things. First, uh, Radhanath Swami Maharaj is a very, very highly elevated Vaishnava. We cannot imitate him in that way, right? So the other thing is, um, there are a lot of nitty gritty details about all of these different moods that we may not be on the level to be able to understand it. I'll take an analogy and then I'll make an example to help you understand it. You know, and I, I really love this as an analogy to simplify things. Is I say I'm going to take a flight from Toronto, which leaves 8 p.m. and I'm going to reach Delhi at 10 p.m. How long is the flight? So we'll say two hours. But what about it? Because we forgot about the time zone differences. I'm saying in the local times. This flight is 15 hours, whatever 16 hours, right? So that is how we do. Because we don't have the full knowledge, we come to wrong conclusions of things because of our lower understanding level, right? So that's why we don't imitate. Right? The other example of, can also be about a higher philosophy versus a lower philosophy of things. Right? So sometimes you might be in a situation where there is a rule, a lower philosophy rule, but there is a higher philosophy rule. In order to protect the higher one, the lower is broken. So this is an example when, uh, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would uh, have his prasad after that, uh, there was a service to massage his feet. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu purposely slept at the doorway in such a way that his feet was inside and there was no other entrance except for the door on which he was sleeping so if you had to massage his feet the only thing you had to do was cross over him to go in and do your massage now crossing over a Vaishnava's body is also an apparat so this devotee is like saying I'm okay to take that apparat of crossing over but I want to do my service I want to serve the Lord so he crossed over, did the massage but then, after doing the massage, when it was his time to do, after the massage, he would go and take his prachar, he did not go to do that. He said, now, crossing over is a higher principle than I am going to take prachar. So now I am not going to cross over. So we understand, so when the, when the senior Vaishnavas, they are doing certain things, they understand these principles and they are applying it. The way we don't come to the level of intelligence, we should not immediately. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much.